And what a beautiful morning it is too. And uh, what a, a wonderful morning to be celebrating the, the risen Lord Jesus, who was dead and is alive. And uh, I'm just going to read a verse from Matthew where uh, the women went to, to the tomb to put the spices on the body of their dead Lord Jesus. And they find the tomb empty. And not only that, there are angels there. And the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. And I thought it would be <coughs> good to uh, say together the words of the chorus of the, um, uh, the song we're about to sing. We'll just say the men's part. So let's say together, Christ is risen, death has been conquered. And the next one, Christ is risen, he shall reign forever. Let's stand and sing together. is risen. Hallelujah. Some uh, notices. Uh, we've got refreshments after the service. If you can stay for a cup of tea or coffee and a, a little something uh, special, then uh, please do join us downstairs after the service. Uh, this evening at six o'clock I'll be preaching and then on Wednesday at seven we'll have our Bible study and prayer meeting. Next Sunday um, we've got our services at 10.30 in the morning and six o'clock in the evening where John Perry from Ammonford, he'll be coming to preach with us. Um, and it's an especially good opportunity for people who don't normally come to Bethel uh, to come along. And uh, there'll be a lunch after the morning service. Uh, so if you would like to come, 
Uh, it would help if you could sign up on the sheet in the notice board downstairs by the door uh, and how many of your friends and family are coming as well and if there are any dietary requirements that would be helpful uh, to know as well. Um, so please do in invite friends and family to uh, next week's uh, morning service especially. Uh, Tuesday to Friday this coming week from 10.30 to 12.30, um, Limitless Church in Morriston are running a, a Bible kids club, holiday club um, for primary school age children. So any primary school age children are welcome to that at Limitless Church in Morriston, 10.30 to 12.30, Tuesday to Friday. Uh, uh, Maya Chad uh, enjoyed seeing the children during the children's talk and also singing outside her house last week. Um, so, she has brought an Easter egg for every child. So, uh, um, at the bottom of the stairs, apparently, there are some Easter eggs for the children. So, if you are a child, you are welcome to take one of those Easter eggs home with you as you leave. Um, oh, one more thing about uh, the evening service tonight, we'll be celebrating communion together. Uh, so, uh, just if, if you wanted to know that. Okay, now it's time uh, for the children to get involved. Uh, we're going to reenact the part of the Easter story, and I'm going to need some volunteers, okay? So first we need uh, two men. Well, two people who want to pretend to be men. Anyone want to volunteer to be uh, a man? Yes, okay, Th these two here. Right. You guys need to uh, put one of those on, okay? And also, um, if you're going to, at the right time, you can need that, okay? Right, what else do we need? We need some women as well. Who would like to pretend to be a woman? Yes, come along. And any other volunteers to be a woman? Do you want to come? Yeah? Great, yeah, come on, come on to the front. Anyone else? Was that, was, yeah, come on then. Right. Um, come over here. Do you want to come? Yeah, come on then. Right, you can pick any, anything from here, or from here, or here to wear. All right, what would you like to wear? Daddy, yes. I don't want it on the side here. Oh, that's okay, you can just try it and see, isn't it? Do you think, do you like this one? Do you like this one? Or, or this one? Do you want this one? No? Okay. Um, let's see, what else is there? What about this one? Do you like this one? This one? Do you like that one? Mm, what else is there? What about this one? You don't like brown? You don't like brown? Oh dear. Um, how about we have this around, around like that? How about that? Yeah? Okay, you like that? Um, what else have we got? Yeah? You just hold it there. You want to hold it there? Okay. Or, yeah, that's it. That's it. Very good. Do you want to put one of these on? One of these? No? No. Okay. Right. Um, while they're getting their costumes together. Uh, oh, we need we need one more man. Yeah? Do you want to come? Yeah. You're going to be called Peter. Okay. Um, so, Peter, why don't you uh, stick that on your head? Okay, let's see. <laughs> All right, and what else do you want? Do you want one of these things? Let's see. Oh, oh, that looks good. How about that? Yeah? Do you want to try that on? Yeah? 
Okay. There we go. Yeah, you got the sleeves there. Okay. Um, right. You two go and stand over there in the dark but over there. All right. And you you stand by the door there. Okay. And you you women, you start over here, okay? Right. Okay. I think we're all set. Where's my little bit of paper gone? I've lost my bit of paper. <laughs> oh, thank you. There we go. All right. Okay. So, this is uh, from Luke's account of the life of Jesus, and it says this. Very early on the first day of the week, the women came to the tomb. Okay, this is, this is the tomb here, okay? And there's a big hole in the tomb here, okay? So the women came to the tomb. You come to the tomb? Can you come up here? Yeah, Ruth, you come over here. Okay, that's great, really good, okay. So they came to the tomb where Jesus was laid and they brought spices that they prepared. You've got some spices in your hands? Okay, very good. Uh, they found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance of the tomb. They went in. Okay, come, come in here. Come. Okay. They went in, but they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wandering about this, two men in shining clothes suddenly stood beside them. The women were very afraid. You're scared. You're really scared, okay? You look scared. Uh, oh, they bowed their heads to the ground. Can you put your heads to the ground? Yeah. Yeah, very good. Well done. The men said to the women, Then the women remembered what Jesus had said. And the women left the tomb Come this way. Come this way. and told all these things to the 11 apostles and the other followers. You tell everyone, tell everyone. Uh, these women were Mary, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and some other women. The women told the apostles everything that had happened at the tomb. But... They didn't believe the women. Oh dear. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb. He looked in, but he saw only the cloth that Jesus' body had been wrapped in. Then Peter went away to be alone, wondering about what had happened. We'll stop there. Why don't we give them a round of applause? Well done. Okay, you get your clothes off. Put your, put your costumes back here. While they're getting their costumes uh, back in, in the boxes, um, we're going to sing now, He Lives, He Lives. So let's stand and sing. He lives, He lives, Jesus the Savior, He lives. Heroes from the grave and he's mighty, 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 mighty to save. Jesus died upon the cross, they laid him in the grave. Three days later, Sunday came, the stone was rolled away. Hear the angels say, He lives, He lives, Jesus the Savior, He lives. From the grave, and he's mighty, 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 mighty to save. Jesus is the only way, he breaks the power of sin. All who come believing, gonna rise again like him. Hear the angels sing, he lives. Save. 
Granny is mighty, 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 mighty to say. To, oh, I should make one mention. Sammy Davis is actually here next Sunday from Ammonford. Uh, John Perry uh, can't make it next uh, Sunday, so uh, Sammy Davis, who is uh, the minister up in Ammonford Church, uh, is coming instead. They work together. So, and we're going to read from one Corinthians chapter fifteen, and we're going to read the first twenty-eight verses. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I deliver to you, as of the first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be, mis, to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by one, as by man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, 
Then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put into subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself also will be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. May, may the Lord bless us and, and give us an understanding of his word this morning. Well, let's come before God in prayer. <clears throat> let's all pray. Our God and Father, we call upon you again this morning because we realize, Lord, there is no other to whom we can go for you have given unto us the words of eternal life. We thank you for that light and for that illumination that comes to us through the gospel. We thank you that this gospel is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believes. And so, Lord, we would pray that you would grant your blessing to be upon us again this day, that as we remember the rising of your Son, Lord, that we might rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, that we might realize afresh this day that it was because of what he has done, that we are what we are by the grace of God. And Lord, we thank you for the blessing that you have bestowed upon us when you first called us and summoned us by the power of your Spirit, who came and illumined the eyes of our understanding. And we came to see and to realize something of the true nature of your Son and the glory of that gospel that has been presented to us in your work. And Lord, we do pray that it might be very precious to us again this day, that we might find ourselves rejoicing and praising you for all of what you have done for us in your Son. Lord, we are reminded that on that day you could cry that it is finished, and that great day of atonement had come, that day marked forever. We realize that there is no repetition of Calvary, we realize that what he did, he did once for all. And Lord, there is no repeat of that death that he experienced. But we thank you that that death was sufficient to cover all our sins. We thank you for the blood of the everlasting covenant, that blood that washes us whiter than snow, that blood that speaks peace to us of reconciliation with yourself. We realize, Lord, that once we were afar off and estranged from you, and yet in the fullness of time you sent your Son into the world. And Lord, we knew that it was to redeem us, to make us your children, to bring us into the family of God, to make us, O oh God, those who were destined to spend eternity with you. We thank you for that joy and that delight that so often fills our hearts as we think upon what our Savior means to us. We thank you that we know that you have loved us with an everlasting love. And with loving kindness, you've drawn us unto yourself. And Lord, we realize that we are what we are because of you and input into our lives. We realize that you have changed us. You have given to us a new heart and a new spirit. You have written your laws within us. You have caused us to walk in the paths of righteousness. You have made us to be a new creation in Christ Jesus. And old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Lord, we thank you for that time when our eyes looked at creation itself, and we knew that there was a God. And we knew that there must be a Creator who has created all things. And Lord, we came to realize that you are not only the God of redemption, uh, the God of creation, but the God of redemption. And that you were the God who did not spare your only Son. But you delivered him up for us all, and how shall you not with him freely give us all things? Lord, we thank you then that as we look back to Calvary, we look forward in anticipation to that day when we shall see him as he is, and we shall be like him. 
What a wonderful change is in store for us. Lord, we still grapple with indwelling sin. We still have to fight with evil thoughts and evil desires and longings of the flesh. And yet, O oh God, we thank you that there is a day coming when the former things shall no longer be remembered, that the sin that inhabited our bodies and our souls shall one day be taken away forevermore, and we shall be like him. We shall be holy and spotless in that place of glory. We shall be in that place where there is joy everlasting. There is peace and contentment. When we know, O God, what it is to dwell in love, which is so pure, that we are those who shall enjoy it forevermore. We thank you for that new creation that you have told us about, a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. And we live in anticipation to living in a world like that when we consider the world in which we live in at this moment of time, what's going on with Ukraine and with Russia and all of the events that are taking place in this world. Lord, we realize that there shall no longer be any wars or fighting or death, but we realize that your peace shall inhabit that place. Lord, we thank you and we praise you then that you have put this hope in our hearts, that hope of glory, that hope that shall take us and translate us into the very kingdom of God when Christ himself shall come in all his power with the angels and the archangels shall sh shout the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall arise and we, Lord, shall be taken up to be with him forevermore. Lord, prepare us for that great day, we pray, that our eyes might, even this morning as we dwell upon your word, that you, blessed Spirit of God, who has inspired and moved men to record these things, that you would come and become the interpreter of that word again this day and open our eyes that we might behold wondrous things out of your law, that we might see and behold the glory of God. And Lord, grant us, we pray, that your Spirit might truly impress upon us your word, that our hearts might be changed and transformed and renewed in such a way that we might be better going out to this place than we were coming in, that we might know that God is with us. Lord, grant us, we pray, such a wonderful sense of the reality and the power and presence of God here in this place. And so we do pray for your servants who shall preach the everlasting gospel this day, that they might know that unction and power of your Spirit to be upon them, and that they might speak about the unsearchable riches of Christ, that they might lift him up and elevate him, that all eyes might be fixed upon him, the risen Christ, that we might see his glory, and that we might be amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love us, sinners condemned and clean. But Lord, we pray, continue to look upon us then and strengthen us with might by your Spirit on the inner man. Equip us then to meet this hour, the need that we find ourselves in. Pray that you would be with Nathaniel this evening as he preaches your word and with Sammy Davis as he comes next week. And we pray that visitors might come and those that were blind at this moment of time might have their eyes to be opened and that they may realize there is a way back into God from the dark paths of sin. And so, Lord, we commit all such to you. Remember us then. Grant your blessing, the blessing of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to rest upon us even this day. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to sing together, Low in the grave he lay.
to be here this morning to remind ourselves, isn't it, of uh, the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And uh, this particular chapter is uh, the greatest of all chapters on the resurrection from start to finish. It's dealing with the resurrection, and it's important for us to grasp and to understand the significance of uh, what the resurrection is all about. And uh, in many ways, what you get here is the Apostle Paul not only defending it, but defining what the gospel is and explaining to these people where they had come from and what they have come to believe and what had been imparted to him to impart to them. And one of the things that uh, is fundamental in what the apostle teaches, not only here in this particular chapter, but throughout the whole of his writings and his letters in the New Testament, is that he wants to explain to people the relationship that they have once they come to faith in Jesus Christ, the relationship that they have with Him, the bond and the union that exists between Him and them. And in many ways, what you get in here, in this particular chapter, you get mention made of Adam being the first man and all of us having descended from Adam and the implication of our connection with Adam, that through him, death has come into this world and all of the things that are associated with that, with the the sin that he committed, and you and I are subject to the bondage and the tyranny of sin and death. But now Christ has come. And the wonderful thing is about the gospel is that it does declare to us, doesn't it, the triumph of what Jesus achieved at Calvary. It's one of those great declarations, isn't it, that Jesus rose from the dead. And because Jesus rose from the dead, of course, he triumphed over death. And in many ways, he spelt death to death itself, and so he was the one who has achieved something that nobody else could ever, ever have achieved, but what we find is that you and I are involved in that by implication. You and I are involved in the resurrection of Jesus. What Paul wants to do is that he wants to describe this relationship, and he wants to speak about Christ as being the first fruits, and you and I as being those who shall follow at a later date. But here he is saying that we are in union with Christ. And the way in which he describes it sometimes, he describes the body of Christ, as it were, as belonging to Jesus, and you and I being members and parts of that body, we are associated to him. And what has happened to the head, what has happened to Christ has also happened and will happen to us in the future in that we will be physically raised up from the dead. And it is one of those things that we are to live in anticipation of, one of the glories that belongs to the gospel, the fact that you and I shall one day, if we are not here when Jesus comes, shall experience a physical resurrection from the dead, something tremendous is going to take place, and something that goes beyond very often our own conception. It's hard for us to grasp all of the significance of that. But in this chapter, what you find is that the apostle wants to describe all of the events surrounding that and the physical body in which we will be raised up. But here is the apostle, when he is writing to these people, he wants to remind them of what he had told them. He wants to explain to them something about the gospel. What exactly is this gospel? Well, it's the gospel, he says, that he had come and he had preached to them there in verses 1 to 4, as it were. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you were saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered, he says, to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. So what he is saying is that there should have been a preparation of heart and mind to believe and to accept the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Why? Because it it was based really upon Old Testament writings, the prophets, you know, the law, all of these things indicated that Jesus 
was to come, and not only was Jesus to, to die, but Jesus was to be raised up from the dead. How often do we find these scriptures that are there presented to us in the Old Testament by way of prophecy, by men whom God has anointed, and God by His Spirit has enlightened and given an understanding of what this gospel is all about and what is going to be happening when Jesus comes. How often have you read something like Psalm 22, where the very words of Jesus upon the cross are actually mentioned there. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And you get this picture, don't you, that David, when he wrote that psalm, he was going through some kind of experience, but that when Jesus was dying, here it is, you read through Psalm 22, and what is it saying? It is speaking about the death and the resurrection of Jesus. It is talking about the experience that he experienced when he was going through death. All of what he was going through, the suffering, the pain, the anguish, all of these things, it is described very vividly. And you can be one of those that reads that, and you can be un not uncertain of what the writer is saying at that time. And you can translate it and bring it from that picture in the Old Testament and place it upon Calvary. It talks about those who were casting lots for his clothes. It talks about those who were around and about and speaking against him. It's so precise. It's hard to believe that anybody reading that cannot see the death of Jesus. Well, you remember what we had last week, isn't it? On the Ethiopian eunuch. When he was sitting there and he was reading, and he was reading from Isaiah chapter 53. And then he asked the question, of course, to Philip, who was he talking about? And then Philip says, doesn't he, about Jesus. He starts to explain, and he tells us that from that very scripture, he takes that. And from that point, he explains to them about the Messiah, and who Messiah is, and what Messiah was doing, and what he would achieve. And Jesus, you remember, when he came after he was raised from the dead. And you remember, he appears to two men as they were going to Emmaus, and tags along with them, as it were, and... At that particular point, they didn't realize or recognize who Jesus was. And then what takes place? When Jesus has a meal with them, and Jen, Jesus opens their eyes to behold who he is, what does it tell us? It tells us that beginning with Moses, he starts to unfold what is to happen to the Christ. He starts, as it were, taking out verses after verses after verses, Relating to himself. Why are you so slow of heart to believe all what the prophets have said? Why haven't you believed and accepted these things? But they didn't recognize who Jesus was. And then it tells us that Jesus opened their eyes and they realized who he was and then Jesus leaves them. But you see, the whole Testament is a, a revelation of prophecy relating to the coming of Jesus. It is, you can say, proof positive of who Jesus was, what Messiah would do when he came. And time and time again, you get quotations in the New Testament relating to Jesus. But it doesn't simply stop there, does it? It's not merely talking about the death of Jesus, but it also used to speak of the resurrection of Jesus they should have been living in anticipation that when Messiah came, Messiah would not only die, but Messiah would be raised from the dead. This is something that he would achieve when Peter gets up and he starts to preach on the day of Pentecost. How much of his sermon is given over to the resurrection of Jesus? It takes quotations from Psalm 16, Psalm 110, it takes a quotation from all over the Scriptures. He says, why are we surprised? This is what God has said. You read through the Acts of the Apostles, and you know, you get the Apostle Paul when he, he is brought before Felix, and he's brought before Agrippa to give an account of what he was doing at that particular time when he was preaching, and there was controversy over the message that he was giving out. And when he was confronted with Agrippa, who Agrippa had connections with the Jews... 
He says, why should it surprise you, King Agrippa? You know, about the resurrection. He says, I know that you believe the Scriptures. There was something fundamental here. He wants to show here was a man who understood something of the Old Testament. And why should it surprise you, he says, that God raises the dead? How many resurrections had already taken place? We get resurrections in the Old Testament. You get resurrections in the New Testament. Ultimately, of course, you've got the resurrection of Lazarus before Jesus enters into Jerusalem. And here was this situation. If there had been so many resurrections before, why should it surprise you that God should raise him from the dead? And you remember the events that transpired the day when Jesus was raised up from the dead. Something unusual, something took place, or when he was crucified, something took place that the dead in Jerusalem, many of those were raised up. It was a significant event. But here is the apostle saying, look, this was foretold, this was prophesied, this is something that was prophesied thousands of years before Jesus ever came. Thousands of years. But it's not even merely that it was a prophetic thing. But what you find, as he says, is that it's become an historical event that we are remembering today. We are remembering the resurrection of Jesus. This is why I won't read all the verses here, but subsequent to this, what he goes on to do is that he wants to describe now the events that transpired when Jesus appears to James and his apostles, and then he goes on to say there were 500 people that Jesus appeared to all at one time, and what happened? Most of those, he said, are still alive today. If you want to have a chat with them, go and have a chat with them, and they will be able to tell you that they have seen the risen Christ. Those that are described in the Acts of the Apostles, chosen of God to be witnesses to his resurrection. This is the gospel, he says, that I declared to you. I brought this message of salvation to you, he says. This is something that I have declared to you. This is something that was delivered to me and I have delivered it on to you. And what are the ramifications of all of that, he says? The ramifications of this, he says, that I am what I am by the grace of God. This is what I am. And I am what I am because of what God himself has done. And there are things that are mentioned in this scripture here that declare and show to us about Jesus, aren't they? Not only about Jesus, but about the implication that it has upon the Apostle Paul. And there are three things that are actually mentioned in this chapter that describe to us the very heart, heart and sequence of the gospel. And that is, there is grace that is mentioned, there is faith that is mentioned, there is hope that is mentioned, and all of these things are given in this particular chapter. I'm going to have to take my coat off at this point in time. It's a bit hot here. Is it hot? How does it mean? But what you find is that the apostle says, look, I am what I am by the grace of God. This gospel has implications for me. It has impregnated my very soul, my very being, he says. Something has happened in my life and something has happened in my experience where God has extended grace to me through this gospel. What you find is that when the apostle was writing to the church in Rome, that he wants to describe to them how the gospel has come. And this gospel has come, he says, because God has opened the floodgates through the death of Jesus. That grace has been extended to us. Justification by grace, he says, has come to us. How? Because God himself has now been liberated because of that sin that bound God, as it were, that he could not extend grace to us. Now there is a sufficient way in which God can extend his grace to you and to me because of what Jesus has done by removing sin and of our guilt, that by Jesus dying at Calvary, it has freed and liberated God to extend grace to lost sinners. And it is because of this, he says, 
in the intervention of God by His grace that I am what I am. And if it wasn't for the intervention of God's grace, I wouldn't be what I am. I am what I am by the grace of God. I mean, something we should all be able to say, isn't it? I am what I am by the grace of God. It doesn't say I, I am who I am. It's not the who, is it? It's the what. And when you deal with the who and the what, they're completely different. We all know about certain people, you know, the personality culture in which we live today, isn't it? We can all know about who people are. You know, is this, that, and the other. And there is a recognition that when you see their faces on television, you say, oh, that's so-and-so. We know who they are, don't we? But we don't know what they are. It's a bit like looking at Putin, isn't it? We know who Putin is, but we also now know what he is. You know? It becomes a revelation to us, isn't it? And what he is, is a revelation to us of the kind of character and person that he is. And this is true of all people. And Paul says, I am what I am by the grace of God. Because what I am is something that God himself has created and God himself has come to me and has made me what I am at this moment of time. It's all in a state and condition has been changed. And this is what I am now, he says. Look at what I was before. Who I was. I was Saul of Tarsus, persecutor of the church. He says, I was one of those. Hostile. Alien. Opposed. Violent. To all of what Christ meant. And you would think, wouldn't you? But how could such a person be saved? He says it in verse 9, doesn't he? He says, I was a persecutor, he says. Quite open and blatantly stating it. And then he goes on to say, I am what I am by the grace of God. What has happened? Oh, when God came, when I met with Jesus on that day in the Damascus Road, what took place was this, that my eyes were open. I saw who Jesus was. I realized my error. I realized my mistake. I was there. What shall I do, Lord? What shall I do at this moment of time? Grace had come in, light and illumination. The heart of this man was changed. From being a persecutor, suddenly God gives him a new heart and a new spirit, and suddenly this man is a changed person. I am what I am, by the grace of God. And it is only through the intervention of God's grace that I am what I am. Do you look back at some time in the past, and you think to yourself, I, I knew what I was. You know, how I lived, how I conducted myself, the things that I did, the sin that I committed. And then suddenly, I was changed. I was no longer what I was. My heart was changed. My longings, my desires, my aspirations, all of what I was changed. I could not be what I had once been. I could not live the way I had once lived. I was changed, fundamentally changed from the inside to the outside, not from the outside to the inside. I was changed. I didn't recreate myself. You know, you get lots of personalities saying that today, don't you? Oh, they recreated themselves and they became this instead of that. This is something that God did. God changed me. God changed me, says the Apostle Paul. I was a persecutor. Now I became a preacher of the gospel. Why? Because I knew and I understood the truth. But you see the Apostle here, isn't it? When he is dealing with these people, he says, look, he says, I am what I am by the grace of God, but you've got to remember that Faith is fundamental to believing this message of salvation, of Jesus dying and of Jesus being raised from the dead. These are the things that I preached to you. When I first came to you, I told you about Jesus being buried and Jesus being raised. I told you all about this. And this is something that you came to believe in the very same way in which I believed it. And because I believed it, he said, so I preached it. 
How could I hold it back? I knew the truth. The truth had set me free. I was liberated. And so I wanted to tell others. I wanted to share the gospel. I preached this message of salvation. I believed this. In one sense, we could come this morning, can't we? We could put our hands up and say, I believe in the resurrection, isn't it? But how do we believe? How do we believe? The apostle, when he's writing to the church in Rome, he says like this, that faith is something of the heart. With the heart, man believes unto salvation. And with the lips or with the mouth, confession is made. And he is talking about the death and the resurrection of Jesus. He is talking about something that enters into the very depths of our soul. It is not something that is merely exterior. It is something that I believe with my mind alone. And I think to myself, yeah, well, I can accept that. I suppose one of the things is that when we remember Easter, sometimes you get people, they go to church at Christmas and they go to church at Easter and they say, well, it reminds me of Jesus' dying and resurrection. But my friend, if you need Easter to remind you of that, then you should check what kind of faith you have. Because the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus is something that lives with believers day in, day out. You see, there are those that the apostle mentions here, isn't it? who can believe in faith. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you were saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you have believed in vain. In other words, it is possible to believe this message of salvation and believe it for a time or for a period. But it hasn't got down into the very depths of your soul. It's not in your heart. But it's in your mind. It's in your thoughts. And it's resurrected sometimes at times like this. In the church's calendar at Easter, isn't it? You are reminded, oh yes, I need perhaps to go to church. I need to be there, you know, because... You know, oh yes, this is the annual event, you know, where we remember Jesus dying and being raised from the dead. Now, true believers don't feel and think like that. Oh, yes, it is an important day and weekend in the calendar for Christians. But fundamentally, what Christians believe is something day in, day out. I believe in the resurrection is something that I believe day in, day out. It's not something that I have to be reminded about. It is something that lives within me. It's a part of my inner being. It's a part of what I believe with all my heart, with all my soul, upon which I trust for my own salvation. It is this that is fundamental. And you can't move away from that. Paul says, look, check to see that you haven't believed in vain. There were all kinds of contentions here. Some were saying, there is no resurrection. Have they believed in vain? People live, don't they? As if this world is everything. Well, if you believe in the resurrection, you believe in a world that goes beyond this world, in a life that goes beyond this life. And so you find the apostle here saying to these people, Look, have you believed in vain? Or is this part and parcel of all of what you believe? You know, you have this faith in a risen Savior, a Savior that died at Calvary and yet has been raised from the dead. And of course, what that means to us is that it takes us on to the final thing, which is hope, isn't it? In verse 17, the apostle says, And if Christ is not risen... Your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. See, what is he saying? He's saying that hope is supposed to go beyond this world. 
If in this life we only have hope, you know, where people say, well, you know, we only have one life. Enjoy this one life that you have because there is nothing beyond it. Now, if that was a Christian attitude, what the apostle is saying here, you know, you might as well, as he goes on to say a little later, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. What is the point of living a good life? What is the point of having a faith in a Savior that did not rise from the dead? And if there is nothing beyond the grave, eat, drink, and be merry. Enjoy what you can at this moment of time because this is the only thing you've got. But the whole argument of the apostle isn't like that, is it? The whole argument is that we do have a real hope. Why? Because Jesus has been raised from the dead. He has executed that death blow to death itself. He has done what? He has removed sin. And because he has removed sin, God has shown it to us quite clearly in that he has raised up Jesus from the dead. It is a testament to God that he himself has dealt with sin once and forever. No repetition of Calvary. The resurrection is a certain thing. It is fixed as well as it was fixed in the Old Testament that Jesus would come and Jesus would die and Jesus would be raised on the third day. It's just as certain through the prophecies of the New Testament and those of the Old Testament that when He comes, all shall be raised. Christ will summon those who are dead in the graves. The trump of the archangel of God shall sound and the dead in Christ shall arise. That's the true effect of what's going to happen because of what Jesus has achieved. The apostle goes on and he tells them about the body that we shall be raised up and some will ask the question, but what body are we going to have? Is it going to be identical to the body we got now? Well, no, it's not, he says. It's not merely going to be a physical body, but it's going to be a spiritual body. There is going to be something that is going to change fundamentally in this body. It will be physical, and yet it will be spiritual. But, oh, the triumph. The triumph of the message of this this glorious hope. There is no hope like this hope, is there? I mean, you look at all the things that people hope for, they're hoping that there may be something after this life. But they're not sure, they, you know, got vague and unfamiliar thoughts going through their minds. But this is so precise. Given out thousands of years in the Old Testament. Witnessed by those who saw the risen Christ in the New Testament. Those who believe in this moment of time, living in anticipation in this glorious hope of Jesus coming again, and the dead in Christ shall arise. He has become the first fruit, he says. But after him, those who believe in Jesus, the resurrection, because of our union with Christ, is sure and certain because of what Jesus has done. At the end of the chapter, you get that glorious declaration, don't you? The mention of what's going to take place in verse 50 and following there, isn't it? Now this I say, brethren, the flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, he says, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal put on immortality. So when this corruption is put on incorruption and this mortal is put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, Hades, where is your victory? Christ is the mighty victor. 
Christ is the one who has dealt with sin. Christ is the one who has dealt with death. Christ is the one who has been raised up from the dead. Christ is the one who is coming again that we live in anticipation of. And for you and I, have we got all those facets that belong to us? We are rejoicing in the grace of God that God has shown us grace and brought us to this place whereby we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And we hope that hope that is given to us in the scriptures of Jesus coming to take us to be with himself. How do you live? Is your faith a living, vital thing in your very being that day in, day out you rejoice that Christ has died and been risen again? Is it so fundamental to you that you cannot live the day without remembering what the Savior has done for you? All of you believed in vain. The whole point is this, that the apostle is saying, look, grace has been extended. This grace manifests itself in a living faith in a risen Savior. It manifests itself in this glorious hope that we do not live in despair, but we live in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection. My friend, that's what makes us what we are. I am what I am, by the grace of God. And if it wasn't for the grace of God, I would not be what I am today. And each and every one of us can say that, can't we? If we truly believe in Jesus. Well, let's pray. Our God and Father, as we remind ourselves of that wonderful achievement of your Son, there was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. He only could unlock the gates of heaven and let us in. Lord, we can say hallelujah, what a saviour. As we remember all of what he has done for us, all of what he has achieved and all of what he will achieve when he comes to take us to be with himself forevermore. Lord, prepare us, we pray, for that great and glorious day when Jesus shall come again. Hear us then in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to sing together our closing hymn, which is, See what a morning gloriously bright with the dawning of hope in Jerusalem.
And now with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and remain upon us now and forevermore. Amen.